Nikita ma'am, it's really honor to meet you and have interview of you. We all are glad that you are the daughter of internationally known author and even you have gained reputation worldwide internationally in your field. So firstly, I would like to ask you that what was the influence of your parents while growing you up, nurturing you, while inculcating values in you? Yes. Well, firstly, I would like to thank you for taking an interest and taking time out of your busy schedule to, to come here. And I don't know, my life has been quite ordinary in a way, but uh, that you have shown an interest in knowing more, it's good. And I feel quite happy to talk to you because you are such a nice person too. So, uh, well, I think I was blessed with very special parents. My father, um, he was a, a pioneering personality uh, in post-independence India or in, uh, during the independence movement and then afterwards. Basically, he was a charismatic Gandhian thinker, a man of great integrity and courage. And above all, and that is perhaps what he is known for, is that he did very extensive historical research which uh, revolutionized our understanding of pre-colonial India, the India just before the British took over. So about 18th, early 19th century India, wrote books, for instance, about the Indian science and technology in the 18th century, where there were descriptions of um, uh, uh, observatories and people having astronomical knowledge that was perhaps in advance of what was known at the time in Britain itself. There, there were people who came there, they said it was as though there was an Isaac Newton among the Brahmins. Yeah. Things like their skills, uh, their knowledge of algebra was considered to be really very developed, highly developed. The binomial theory was known to them before it was known in, in Europe. But then in the, the field of medical science, for instance, the smallpox vaccination, uh, smallpox inoculation, it was called inoculation at that time, was being practiced in India and it's described in the region of Bengal. And there it's, uh, in a way, it's very appropriate for to, to know about this today because the way the, the co-vaccine uh, vaccination has been prepared. It's in a way very similar to way, the way the um, smallpox inoculation was done. The virus, you know, some of the uh, bacteria of the of smallpox was induced into the uh, patient and through that antibodies uh, developed and they developed an immunity to, to smallpox. And they said that more than 90% of people who were treated in this way didn't get smallpox and then there was plastic surgery was being done was being performed there was iron and steel that was being made in small furnaces that could be moved from place to place it was i think it was a tribal population that was mainly uh, concerned with making these it was with the, uh, creating this the or in charge of the furnaces and this had been done for centuries. Steel that was being prepared was considered to be one of the best in the world at the time. As good as Swedish uh, steel that had a reputation for being the hardest, the sharpest uh, in the world. And then the agricultural techniques, um, one used the drill plow, which was a very, very sophisticated way of uh, plowing and putting seeds into the earth. Then irrigation works, small irrigation channels were done in a very sophisticated manner. There was ice making in places like Allahabad. The principle of refrigeration was known. Then uh, there was paper making. All this is described in the book. But he also did work on, uh, showed how there were educational institutions at the local level that were teaching the majority of the, the children. Not uh, the Brahmins were being, Brahmin children were taught at home mm -hmm. more. Um, but this would be, you know, uh, the, the mass of the population was being taught in these local village schools that were being funded through local resources. So, uh, you know, the British, when they came, they said, 
India has to be educated according to English uh, English um, system with English medium in the school. But this, the indigenous schools that were, had been functioning well and were providing a very democratic kind of education for everybody were no longer able to be funded because the taxation was so exorbitant, the land tax and that, that was but prior to that, it was being the from the land tax or from the, the the village economy was able to fund all these local institutions. Also, the medicinal experts they were being funded by the local village economy. But once the exploitative tax is so high, nothing is left at the village level. So within fifty years or so, these institutions all. Uh, become a lot weaker, don't function properly, and in the end they wither away. And then one, um, people had forgotten that they existed, but these were reported about by British observers uh, who were interested in knowing you know, what was happening there. And a lot of this information was used then in Britain for the purposes of uh, developing the British science and technology at the time. And it was then developed further. So anyway, that is one thing. And then my mother, she was a extraordinarily magnanimous, a very generous-hearted and high-minded uh, lady post Second World War Britain, who felt uh, very inspired by what she had known, what she knew about Gandhian, Gandhian movement, and then also tried to adjust to a very simple lifestyle in a Gandhian ashram. Yeah. Um, in uh, the foothills of the Himalayas in Rishikesh, Pashulok, that's where they were in the uh, early 50s. So I have been inspired by their example, but also by their uh, education. Uh, they inculcated me with, with very important values. I think perhaps stressing uh, the importance of the simplicity of life. Simplicity of lifestyle, of having uh, the highest integrity, and showing commitment to work, and have focus, and taking and choosing a goal, and then seeing that it is realized. I think these were values that um, have influenced my last almost seven decades and with age I realize their value even more and uh, in a way they, they they symbolize humanistic values living a life of integrity of simplicity showing respect for others and showing respect for their their beliefs uh, their opinions their way of life not um, not being judgmental Mm -hmm. um, but and um, living uh, a life though with a cosmopolitan outlook and trying to be open to other uh, regions of the world and other views uh, but um, retaining one's own focus and uh, being in harmony with, with oneself and, and trying to do what one can uh, for others to make the world a better place as one would say. So those were those I think are the the values that I grew up with and that have influenced my life. You have lived abroad for so many years. You have spent most of your life in Europe. So uh, what sort of difference do you feel that there is in between life and etiquettes and civilization in India mm -hmm. and in Western countries? Yes. You ask such fundamental questions, <laughs> but uh, yes, I mean, just a little insight into my biography. I was born in India, uh, in Masuri, in the Himalayas, but uh, went to England, to the UK, when I was just one year old. Yeah. Um, but then the, with my family, I re returned when I was five. And uh, from the age of five until 11, I spent almost seven years, almost 12 I was, uh, almost uh, seven years in South Delhi, which was very idyllic then. We used to see peacocks. Uh, it was a bit like uh, Anubhuti campus. Um, and uh, we'd go bareback back 
horse riding among the, the Muslim ruins. It was a, a very idyllic time. I mean, now there's, there's no natural uh, sort of free space there. Everything is built up. This was not far from Qutub Minar where we lived. And uh, as a result of these seven formative childhood years, uh, my um, cultural but also emotional bond with India is very strong. And I've always felt that it's really amazing how I feel at home in uh, Europe, where I spent most of my life, but also in India. Um, but at the same time, I realized that there are big differences between European and Indian life, um, about which so many there's libraries have been written. <laughs> so what do I say in a few in a nutshell, I would say that maybe the difference is that life in India is community based, where the community and relations you have with, with your family, your the extended family and with friends are very important, more important than in Europe. In Europe, uh, life is more individualistic. There, the individual is the center, not the community. So families are there, but they don't play such an important role. And I think that uh, in Europe, it's the institutions of the church, of uh, sport clubs, sports clubs, whatever, uh, rules and regulations that impact more on the life of an ordinary European than is the case in India. I think in India it's because one is um, because one is within the community, the relationships you have in your community, in your family, with your friends are more defining. The, the state is there, but it is a sort of it's a supra structure and um, it's tangential. It's not doesn't impact so much on your life, or at least on your uh, understanding. I mean, of course, it uh, does cause problems, uh, but I think that is one of the main uh, main differences. I mean, one could say more, but I think maybe we can move on, on to, to yes. the next question. Okay, now I would really like to ask you that which are your favorite tourist destinations, like be it in India or abroad, anywhere? Yes. Well, um, I wouldn't say that I know the whole world, <laughs> but I, I of the seven continents i've lived on three of them i mean asia europe and north america and i've just visited uh north africa so just uh, briefly we'll, let's start with europe where i spent most of my life i think the capital cities of europe that i've visited uh, london paris rome uh, lisbon uh, would be the main ones uh, that i think they offer a lot from the point of view of cultural, cultural life. Um, you can see something of, of the culture, the cultural heritage of the countries there in the museums and art galleries. And they're, they're quite beautifully structured too, architecturally. And then there's also the parks in the middle of the city in London, in Berlin, you have lakes. Um, in Rome, you have the ancient city, the, the Roman Empire, you have the old, old, old ruins. So I think these uh, the capital cities are worth visiting. And I visited them a number of times. I lived in London. I spent my youth there. But I have also spent very happy days in Berlin, in Paris. I did my PhD in Paris and uh, uh, enjoyed, I think I perhaps enjoyed living in Paris even more than in London, because Paris is more compact um, and uh, it's very dynamic um, and somehow you can walk, you can walk from one end of Paris to the other, whereas you can't do that in, in, uh, in London. And when I was a student, I went there as a student without a scholarship to begin with and I think I had a hundred pounds and I said this hundred pounds has got to last me for a long time. <laughs> so I decided I was not going to use any public transport, which was quite cheap, but I thought I would even save there. So I started walking 
you know, wherever I had to go, I, I went on foot. So I got to know Paris very well. Um, That's nice. Yes, and, that, and Paris, with Paris, I had a, I developed a very close affinity. And um, when I had to leave Paris, because then I started my postgraduate studies at Cambridge, I felt as though I was leaving behind an old friend. And it was nobody in particular whom I was, uh, you know, uh, taking leave from. It was the city. And I felt really sad going on the airport bus, you know, past all the sites that I had visited, the Tuileries, Jardin du Luxembourg, all the beautiful places where I used to walk. So this Paris, I think, but, but Rome, um, London, Lisbon, I discovered later on, very beautiful city. Yes, but then uh, the countryside, Britain, you have the, the seaside resorts, small ones, Cornwall, Wales, very beautiful, very quiet, uh, not, not spoiled by tourism. We used to spend, uh, uh, my mother made a point that we, every year we should have a summer holiday, and that was usually at the, the seaside. So that, and then uh, also the British countryside, the Lake District, which is uh, uh, a place where it always rains, but it's very nice. It's supposed to have a sort of romantic uh, touch to it. And uh, a lot of writers and poets have, have lived there, or have, have been inspired by the environment also to compose nice poems or write novels. But then in Europe, continental Europe, uh, in the Black Forest in Germany, very impressive. Uh, but uh, Germany is, a, I would say, a very pretty and very quite diverse um, a country because uh, Germany, like India, is, is federally organized. And so each of the states has its own special culture. And the culture also impacts on the architecture, also the landscape to a certain extent. So uh, there, Germany, I, I think, is, uh, has lots of very interesting places that you can visit. Then you have the Alps that are between, I mean, Germany, France, and Italy, and, and Switzerland, are very beautiful. But then other parts of the, the world, I mean, um, I, I've just spent uh, a few holidays in East Asia, in China, I had a very nice uh, sort of touristy holiday. That was uh, my daughter speaks Chinese fluently and she acted as my guide. And then there was a host family who also uh, accompanied us um, uh, on some of our excursions. I mean, besides Beijing, we went to the southeast. It's a province called Yunnan. Um, and I remember a very nice town called Lijiang, very beautiful. China is basically considered to be a Han Chinese, or the people, the majority, uh, supposed to be Han. But in this uh, Yunnan, there are something like 20 different ethnic groups, maybe even more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and it's very, very beautiful landscape wise as well. Japan, that's where I went recently because my, my daughter got married to a, a Japanese. He's a colleague of hers, also an economist uh, who's studying at Yale and uh, uh, all very, uh, very cosmopolitan. But uh, they had their wedding then in, in uh, Japan, in Tokyo. But then we went to Kyoto, which is the old capital. Very beautiful, very beautiful. I was really impressed by, by Japan and especially by Kyoto. Of course, one has this the, this combination of high modern technology, but the emphasis on and the appreciation and in a way the care that is taken for preserving tradition, that is there at the same time. And I think uh, about Kyoto is, is so well uh, uh, kept to. They're very, the, the Japanese are very proud of their own traditions, their own everything you know, should be kept carefully. You, know? they, you don't throw anything. If you if somebody throws a bit of paper or something on the, the ground, then a, another passerby would come and pick it up. It's not right, you know, to do it. Um, and the Japanese wouldn't do it anyway, you know, but by mistake, say. Uh, uh, and um, very polite, but also keeping your distance. 
you don't necessarily smile at strangers. <laughs> Uh, we, or, uh, or you don't ask strangers questions like it happens in India. So there one could think that Japanese are a little bit are not so friendly, you know, that they keep themselves to themselves. But it's once you get to know them that it's very nice. But I, this was my first visit to Japan in 2019. And I hope to go there again after our pandemic. Then uh, what else? Yeah. Uh, I was in uh, South Korea for a short visit and uh, I found Seoul a very interesting city, big city that's expanded enormously, uh, you know, within about 15 years. Its uh, population and size expanded by something like eight to tenfold. The Koreans are very, very hospitable and very funny and, uh, and joking and all uh, that. Uh, so we had a good time there. I went to Singapore, but just briefly. I had to go to a conference, uh, so, uh, but I thought that was an interesting cosmopolitan uh, city. It's very, the influence of China, China is there, but you have the sort of native um, Malaysians and uh, a lot of Indians. And um, we met an Indian Sikh who had, uh, was a doctor who's, who, uh, whose parents had come during the freedom movement and, and they stayed there and uh, so it was, uh, I mean, and there are lots of Indian restaurants and uh, I mean, quite a lot of the Indian community I think is quite well represented there. Then I went to uh, Malaysia to Penang, it's a small, it's a kind of peninsula, uh, it's a uh, very, sync there's a sort of syncretic religious, uh, religiosity there because you have temples that could be sort of Hindu but then you uh, there would be some Buddhist figure in it mm -hmm. and then maybe even something Islamic. Uh, it's all very syncretic that was very interesting and then Kuala Lumpur of course very very modern you know with the high sk skyscrapers but the, the only glimpses of that I didn't stay there long but I would like to see more of uh, Southeast East Asia, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, you know, there's Indonesia as well. So uh, there's still a lot that I would, I haven't seen and would like to see. And uh, India, I've seen, I would say, sort of tourist sites probably more than, uh, you know, really getting to know India properly. But uh, say starting with Kerala with the tea gardens and the backwaters, <laughs> Uh, in Tamil Nadu, the temple cities, in Karnataka also, in Mysore, and the, um, the uh, uh, Hampi, the ruins of Vijayanagar Empire, then uh, in Maharashtra where we are, a Kandesh region I like very much, but I haven't had a chance to get to know it so well. I mean, I, I like Mumbai very much. I think I prefer Mumbai to Delhi, to Delhi now. I mean, Delhi in my childhood was nice, but uh, now I like uh, Mumbai. And Pune, very much, yeah. Um, those are the two cities that I've visited. There's a lot more to see. Uh, but then uh, Gujarat, the Kutch region, I like very much. And uh, Rajasthan, Jaipur, Udaipur, Mount Abu. Abu. Then, uh, of course, uh, yeah, Agra, Taj Mahal. But uh, yeah, it's okay. But uh, uh, it's, um, I think, maybe overrated. And now, especially due to the, you know, the smog. And, but it was, uh, I remember going there with my family. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, in the hills, the uh, Kumaon region. I haven't been to Kashmir. I'd like to go there. And uh, Bengal, uh, been to, uh, or to Varanasi. I remember you know, going there as a student. Bengal, Kolkata, also as a student. That was, but those were... Very lively, the coffee house culture was uh, I remember, Kolkata. Huh? in Kolkata, Kolkata, yeah. And then I also went to Shanti Niketan oh. out, outside uh, Kolkata. Uh, very serene place, very nice. Uh, Orissa, Puri, I mean Jagannath Puri, and then uh, Puri, uh, the beach, and uh, but also Bhubaneswar, Konara, all that. That's very impressive. Madhya Pradesh, uh, I've seen Bhopal, I think is a very very nice city um, and indoor, you know, I have a cousin living there, so it's very nice. Yeah, um, and Sri Lanka I've been to as well, uh, which I, I was very impressed by Sri Lanka. 
It's very different to India and the Buddhist culture is very important. And somehow I feel they've managed to deal with the colonial impact better than in India. Somehow it's the culture is more intact. I think the colonial um, impact on Indian culture, uh, and especially on uh, the lives of educated people, has been very great in India. I mean, in Sri Lanka, there is also, to a certain extent, it is there, because also in the education, but somehow uh, I think the people, the ordinary people, and also in the schools, it seems to be more the indigenous is dealing with. And I think there's uh, people talk than uh, Sinhalese, and Sinhalese is being taught in, in schools, maybe not as much English medium as in India. And the way things function, I mean, the infrastructure, of course, Sri Lanka is so much smaller than India, but the roads, very good. I mean, some of it's like in Germany. And uh, the services, hotels, or the way uh, things are organized, you know, in also the arrangements at, at tourist destinations. Very nicely done, and uh, I think free for Sinhalese, but as an Indian, I had to pay almost, I think it was almost the same as what Europeans, I mean Westerners had to pay. So I thought that was not too good, um, but uh, they have beautiful uh, Buddhist sites, uh, very, very special. Anuradha uh, Puro, whether there's a the Bodhi tree, part of seedling from the Bodhi tree from Bodh Gaya, brought there, and it's become so, so big, you know, so from, from about would it be the 5th century or before that? And that, the Bodhi tree, is a site for pilgrimage. People come to see that. Yes. And you, you have so many people coming there, and it's so quiet. But there's, I mean, it's quiet, but then there's also the chanting of hymns, and but so serene. Yeah, maybe quiet is not the right word. It's more serene. So you do hear some sound. It's very serene. Uh, very, very impressive. Uh, you feel there's some, it's a, it's a spiritual experience. All the lights up, quite yeah. positive. Yeah, yeah, very, very, no, no tension and uh, yeah, very, very special, yes. Um, so Sri Lanka, I'd like to visit Sri Lanka again. You know. The place I went to in Africa is Egypt. Uh, this was um, for a seminar, but it was at the time of the Arab Spring. And somehow my group was brave enough. They said, we, we're going to do it and all that. And wherever we went, uh, we were a, a group of international scholars. Um, so people from, from Russia, from the Ukraine, from Poland, from France, from, from Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, from uh, India, from China, uh, from Britain. You know, and so people saw that we were all very different people. Uh, yeah, and uh, we were welcomed everywhere. And we carried the Egyptian flag with us. So, I mean, our, I think our group leader. So it was, it was a very special experience because Egypt derives a lot of its income from the tourist industry. And yet there was nobody coming. So, I mean, because of the, you know, one was scared that there's going to be a revolution or something. Oh, yeah. So, and we were the only foreign group sort of there. Oh, I mean, probably some other people as well. But so we, wherever we appeared, we were surrounded then by people trying to sell their tourist uh, uh, wares. And, um, but um, the, and they, you have these Egyptian men, quite tall, wearing their long robes. You know, and to get money, they sell these things, or they are offering to take us on a, in a sort of horse and carriage. And we wanted to walk; we didn't want to. You know, this was quite uh, quite an experience. But then visiting the pyramids was very special. You know, that's that's pre-Islamic, and it's amazing the way they've been preserved. This was uh, yeah, uh, there. I would like to go again. But it was a it's a completely different culture to the Islamic one and the relationship between the traditional sort of relationship between Egypt and India seems to be very strong. Uh, they say that it's because of the rice growing, you know, on the, the Nile in Egypt and then India in the south and in the east. 
At that time, Gandhi was very much in the news, you know, for nonviolent protest. And the, the Egyptians put that into practice. You know, they were protesting against uh, Mubarak, huh? but in a nonviolent way. In Gandhi Square, huh? the, the 2011, I think it was. Huh? So that, that was a ex uh, very interesting experience. And uh, one learns going to places, especially if you have contact with the people of the place, there one can learn something uh, about the culture, gain insights into a different way of thinking, different way of living, and uh, then learn to appreciate it and respect it. You know, not, not necessarily wanting to uh, adopt those practices, but to see that you know one can live differently and also be happy and uh, uh, have a good life. Yeah. yeah, I visited the U.S. perhaps half a dozen times or more, maybe more. Uh, but uh, twice I spent a year there, and uh, basically in California. But I have visited the, the East Coast. I mean, we landed in New York, and New York is incredible. You know, the skyscrapers. I wouldn't say it's my favorite tourist destination. I don't like um, these big cities. I felt it's a bit like an urban jungle. You know? um, <laughs> and uh, one feels also a little un uh, uneasy. I remember when we first went to America, it was our very first visit, and we were received by a, an old friend of my father's, a Jewish gentleman, and our children were young. Uh, they were four and five years old, and um, we wanted to go to a jazz concert. And the friend who liked jazz as well, he thought, okay, you know, I'll take the responsibility, I'll, I'll take them there. And uh, we had a wonderful evening. And then coming back, we were all rather happy, you know. And then he'd given us instructions that when we're in the subway, that's in the underground train, you don't make eye contact with anybody. You just keep your eyes down and don't, you know, jostle anyone. And, and then we got, everything went well. We got off the platform and there was um, a little uh, a sort of Afro-American boy with a ball and my son who was just five he wanted to touch the okay, ball you know, the, yeah. and then there's a woman who looked as though it would be the older sister of this little boy said don't let that white kid touch your ball and the, my, the answer that my son gave is I'm not white I'm a quarter Indian <laughs> so <laughs> And, and she just looked and, and we all smiled. And, but our host, he said, oh, that was very silly, your heart. You shouldn't have done that, touch the ball, you know. Could have caused uh, a flare-up, you know. Um, if there'd been some more African-Americans around, it could have caused you know, some problem. But it's, uh, New York is very interesting. The point of view of museums, art galleries, I mean, it's, it's the best in the world. But perhaps more than New York, I like Washington. Washington is very well structured. And you can take a, a bus that goes around. You can hop on and off the bus and see all the, the different sites. You know, well, part of this part teaches you about American history. But the place where we spent most of our time was in California at Stanford University. Beautiful campus. When I came here and we got to Jane Hills, the, the palms palm trees. There's a, the main um, avenue in Stanford is called Palm Drive. And I said, this is a small version of Palm Drive. Really. <laughs> um, but uh, no, uh, Stanford is, is quite a, a well, a very extensive campus. Uh, it was really nice. I mean, spending a whole year because uh, you don't really have any winters and it doesn't rain much. So, you know, having little children, you know, you don't have to dress them with socks and uh, scarves and all that kind of thing. Uh, they were, you know, barefoot and they, they enjoyed it and we could go to the, the beach. Beaches are very close by and, and people are very friendly. And one thing about America is that the ordinary people are really friendly. They want to help. It's uh, people who are moving all the time. You know, they've always come from somewhere else. So they get to know the place quickly. They want to feel at home in a new place.
but every few years they may be moving. Not not everybody, of course, but uh, and so when we arrived there, the people in our condominium they would uh, tell us, you know, where the best uh, supermarket was, where the playground was, where the best beach was, where you could have the best Mexican food, you know, all the giving all the good advice and um, the weather, clear blue skies, you know, uh, it's, it's called the golden state and that's the reason, you know, it's the sun shines there and uh, we drove down to the Mexican border at Christmas along Highway 1, very, very nice, uh, I mean, passing by various places, uh, we sat, uh, this, we went to, yeah, I think we celebrated Christmas uh, in Disneyland wow. <laughs> and then went on to San Diego, which is on more or less on the, on the Mexican border. Um, so I went into Mexico, but I didn't have a visa. And so when we came back, we were a little worried in case they asked for my passport. They could have thought that I was a Mexican immigrant, you know, trying to cross the border illegally. Um, but uh, we were checked. Um, no, this, but uh, the American uh, American life is is quite easy going. Uh, driving in America is much better than in Germany. I mean, you, you have a speed limit of sixty miles an hour, hmm? and so you can you could you sort of float along the highway, hmm? and it's, you feel very relaxed. And uh, traveling in America is also very very easy. You have these motels, hmm? so people who are traveling by car. They stop at a hotel, which is linked to their motel, their motor car. You know, so, so it's called mo motels, and very reasonably priced. And there's always, there's usually no food that is offered in the hotel, but there's always a breakfast place that is attached to the the hotel. And so, uh, and they give really wonderful breakfasts. Um, there's you can sort of all all you want to eat. You know, so if you have a good breakfast and you don't need any other food for the rest of the day more or less. But we also went to Las Vegas in California. In a way it, it's modernity, commercial modernity, uh, a lot of gambling, it was entertainment. I, it was quite interesting I mean, especially where they have, they try and reproduce all the, the cultural sites of the world. You know, so you have the pyramids in, inside some uh, Las Vegas hotel um, and uh, it's done quite well. I mean, it looks quite real because uh, like in Disneyland, you know, everything is sort of uh, reproduced, uh, imitation. It's, uh, it's okay, but um, it's rather fake, not, not, not real. And uh, yeah, after a while you've had enough. I mean, just, I think we stayed there one night and so one day. That was enough. Um, and, but the in America, what you have is landscape, whereas in Europe you have countryside. There's a difference between landscape and countryside. You have these beautiful mountain ranges, um, the Rocky Mountains, the national parks, um, Yosemite. Uh, but uh, my son has just been across. He traveled across uh, America, uh, four thousand miles. Uh, by by car, um, and there they pass through Ye Yellowstone Park. Uh, very very beautiful. And where the nature is, it's a, really a national national park where nature is preserved and looked after. So you have you know the old old animals that used to inhabit uh, the American continent, the bison, which have been depleted considerably. There they are still, you still have quite a lot of bison, but then others, uh, stags, a reindeer kind of thing, and then other smaller animals. I think they may also have leopards. In the, and, and in uh, this Yellowstone, it's, um, it has uh, mountains that are quite high, at altitude of something like 3,000 feet. So it can be this snow-covered mountains. There's one a national park that is very special. Called Dryce Canyon, where it consists of rocks uh, that have a very that are looks as though they're, they're sculpted. 
you know, I said when I first saw it, I said these the original inhabitants of America were um, were artists that they they sculpted these rocks, you know, it's sort of uh, sandstone rocks, and they they have these shapes. It's I mean, one of them is called Fifth Avenue, uh, like in a, in a America, because you have these towering rocks and a very narrow passage and it's as though you're going down you know fifth avenue or um manhattan um others there's one that's called queen victoria it looks like her head you know the the, the bust of queen victoria um and then napoleon <laughs> i mean all these all the world figures see, seem to be represented there and uh, and in the sunlight, especially at dusk, the, this sandstone radiates. Uh, it's sort of translucent, um, reddish color. You know, it sort of comes alive and yeah, really spectacular. It's very quiet there. You know, um, I mean, people behave properly in these parks. And not uh, to see. Um, I mean, there are other places that are perhaps less attractive, like Death Valley, um, where it gets very, very hard. I haven't been there. America, um, and also, you know, in the, the Midwest, I mean, Chicago, the Windy City, that's a very nice. They're also quite cosmopolitan and um, very friendly people. So San Francisco uh, is on the west, uh, western coast of the Pacific. It's uh, the uh, sort of diametrically uh, opposite to New York, which is on the uh, East Coast and on the Atlantic. And San Francisco, though it's in, um, in America, it seems to be, it's a bit like a, a European city. It's perhaps the most European city in America. Although, I mean, there are some smaller towns in America where they try to copy uh, British architecture or Dutch architecture, but um, San Francisco is more like Southern Europe. And uh, recently, I went to Lisbon, um, uh, the capital of Portugal, and uh, I thought this is really very similar to San Francisco because uh, we'd spent a year there twice. Um, and Sa San Francisco is really, I mean, it's European, but also very um, American. It's um, also influenced by the hippie movement, flower power, you know, that kind of thing, and uh, very sort of free and easy. Um, and it's, um, it's on the coast, but also quite hilly. So you have slopes, uh, quite steep slopes, and you have um, trams uh, that go up these slopes, well, very steep, and um, and also come down, you know, when you're coming down, you think you're going to go right to the Pacific. Um, and um, uh, it's, a, it's a very lively atmosphere, lots of restaurants and cafes and parks. Um, and then you have the Golden Gate Bridge, which links up to, to the other side, the islands. And uh, um, you could go and see walk through forests of redwoods. These redwood forests are, uh, have uh, these um, redwood trees that are centuries old, really old trees. And we used to like that, um, doing visiting there. Um, but uh, San Francisco itself is a, a, a very uh, colorful and uh, you, you have a, it's, there's a lightness. Uh, so you feel as though you're sort of walking on air there. You feel carefree without any cares. We, we celebrated the 4th of July there. That's the, the American national holiday in the park, you know, where people, families come out and have picnics. And um, it, was, it was very nice. Um, but then you have also um, uh, music concerts that are given in the parks and also plays, open air plays. Of course, there is the, you know, other kinds of culture, the sort of uh, beat culture, rap, all that. And uh, then perhaps um, uh, also less, uh, less pleasant things, you know, drug culture and all that. But it's not as much as, say, in Chicago or New York. And um, 
Yeah, now my son is based in Berkeley, which is the, the California State University, and uh, they they visit San Francisco very often, and so I'll probably my next visit will, will be there. Yes. So so America is worth seeing. Um, Canada, I haven't been to. Latin America, I mean uh, Mexico. I just we just went over the border to Tijuana. Um, but uh, I wanted to go to Mexico City at one stage and to a place called Cuernavaca where a, a special um, community had been set up. Uh, it was influenced by Gandhi, a man called Ivan Illich. He set it up there uh, and uh, he's, he's an interesting person because he, he propagated de-schooling society. You know, to, to, without schools that you should uh, teach your children in the community. Anybody who has some kind of profession mm -hmm. should be a teacher, you know, teaching the, the, child, the children uh, about things that one should know in life uh, and give them special skills. He was greatly influenced by Gandhi, but then has, was more accepted in, in the Latin American context. Uh, yeah, he originated in Eastern Europe. Yeah. So there'd be a lot more to say, but uh, yeah. I think this is, just gives you some glimpses.